Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Hey, John. Well, um, I'm here to talk about UX strategy. And um, it's a really interesting topic for me because I started quite a long time ago. And I went through different companies around the world. And I just want to share a little bit of the insights I go during all this time. So um, this is me. You can, you can verify that it's me. Uh, <laughs> Since I was a kid, I always wanted to grow a beer, so I'm, I'm living the dream right now. Um, I, I come from Buenos Aires, and I live in a couple of different places, and now here in uh, Singapore. I'm really happy to be here today. During my career, uh, I went through a different you know, uh, spectrum of roles, uh, from graphic designer to interface engineering. I'm still trying to figure out that, what that means. Um, so if you guys want to reach out to me, uh, I'm on Twitter. Um, there's a link in Twitter to more ways of getting in touch. So if you guys want to share some thoughts about this presentation or whatever you guys want to share, uh, I'm open to have a conversation. So please go ahead. For today, um, so I want to tell you guys where's, where everything started for me. Um, I want to talk about a little bit the cost of not having a UX strategy in your company. Um, I want to talk a little bit about value. What's, what's, uh, what's UX or design brings as valuable to, different, uh, to companies in different stages. Um, I have some tips on how you guys can start defining your own strategy. And then I want to bring an example of what a user-driven corporation means and uh, what they're doing right now. I think it's really inspiring. And then if we have time, I have more stuff to share. So our main focus for today is basically UX and uh, strategy related to user experience. So what's the first thing comes to your mind when you think about UX, right? That's the first question I asked myself when I started thinking about this presentation. And if you go to Wikipedia, um, user experience refers to a person's emotions and attitude about using a particular product system or service, right? When I think about UX, the first thing that comes to my mind are these two nice fellows right here. So uh, I, I guess most of you are familiar with them. They're huge guys, uh, Don Norman and Jacob Nielsen. They started their own consultancy uh, Nielsen Norman Group in 98, and since then are being like the leading boys on a lot of things related to user experience and how we build products. And if you go to their web page, you're going to find slightly different definition, right? They, they, they say that user experience encompasses all aspects of end user interaction with the company, its services, and its products. So it's a bit wider that shows product and service. Uh, this is Don and Jacob. Uh, <laughs> It's a killer name for an indie rock band, if you ask me. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, so, but this is a really old topic, right? It didn't start it in 98 with these two fellows. It goes way, way back. And for me, it started with uh, understanding usability or, or getting, in, getting involved in usability as a discipline. Uh, I started designing interfaces a long time. And when I first heard about usability, I was just I, I didn't understand really well what, what it was about, so I, I, I tried to deep, really dive, uh, to take a really deep dive on it. And I learned a lot of things that I was doing wrong, right? And I learned tools and different aspects of my, uh, my own discipline, basically. Um, and, and it helped me improving my game a lot in how to approach products and how to make them better. I had the amazing opportunity to be part of the World Ability Day a couple of times, in the early 2000s, and I met incredible people that uh, inspired me a lot. And I think the main takeaway from that experience was we're here to solve problems for people, and that's the main thing. And when I, as soon as I understood that, I was like, oh, okay, so I'm actually making a difference. I, I'm really happy to be here now. Um, so what we're trying to do is like uh, we make a huge effort to make a really complex process simple and accessible. Usability 15 years ago, <laughs> we were saying a lot of things about it. 
One of them was it can improve your return of investment in, in like 153%. And that was huge. Like if you think about it, 100, improving that return in 153% is like awesome. And we were talking about simple things, just guerrilla usability and user research, uh, cheap and quick methods with pen and paper or pencil and paper. And um, it, was, it was easy to execute. It was um, easy to get value really quickly. Uh, when I say return on investment, I meant any of these things, like conversion rate, traffic numbers, user performance, or any target feature usage, right? Back then, it was, it was simple. It was just grab a paper, start drawing things, um, show it to people, and you get like com completely, you realize how wrong you were on <laughs> the first sketch. And that was really interesting for me because like, um, when I was starting doing this, all around me, like it was software developers with fancy computers and like gadgets and things, and they were making fun of me because they thought, man, you're bringing your kindergarten experience to the company, <laughs> like, you know, crayons and doing colors on paper. Um, that, that, was, that was really fun. Five, G, five years later, that number went down 85%. And that's really interesting to ask why, right? We were like for 100, 53% return of investment for, to, to 85. Um, well, basically, that happens because we as a professionals, we learn a lot, right? We did a lot. A technology got up and stood up for all these standards we were trying to push. We started getting guidelines and better information on how to build products. And, um, but the user research budget like, stood the same. So it's not like we, we step up in a lot of places except for the main ones. So picture that, like, back then, convers common conversion rate average was 1%. Today, it's 3%. That means, like, users also learn a lot of things, and they're, like, used to specific patterns on how to interact with products. This is me 10 years ago. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, yeah, this is actually me um, with a braid and everything. Um, so with a couple of frameworks, a browser and a computer, we can just build a prototype really quick, iterate on the same day, show it to people, get some insights, and keep modifying the prototype in the same day. And that was like a huge value for a company. And when they started realizing that, um, they started paying more attention. So uh, as cheap as you can, th this is one of the tips I wanted to share, as cheap and as fast as you can do this, uh, it's always a, a great kickstarter to start showing value to your peers or your managers. Usability today has like bigger challenges, right? Uh, there's new devices and peripherals. It's not just screens. It's, uh, it means a lot more, like, you know, gestures and, I don't know, voice control, self-driving things all around, uh, AR, VR. Um, we have that data science is incredible. The things you can you can do with machine learning today is out of this uh, out of this world. I mean, back then I was thinking about um, about how can we improve things, and now with all the technology we have on our on our reach, uh, we're actually living in the future. Now I realize we're living in the future. Uh, of course, scary AI that I'm really scared about it, but uh, we can talk about it later. So if you see Luke Wilson research, well, it's not research, it's about uh, just uh, visualization of a research, you can see that right now the decline in market is screens. So if we, if we only keep paying attention to screens, we're going to have left behind a lot of little things. Big screens are fading away. I'm not saying they're going to go away, but they're like fading away. Um, you know, hand computers like phones and tablets are, are now the rulers. And there's an emerging market that is really interesting. I mean, who owns like an Alexa or a Google Home? Like there's, there, some people have, like, thank you. <laughs> some people have those things right now, and I'm pretty sure they're really useful for specific things. So uh, even the cars uh, already have like voice controls. So basically we need to start coming up with new recipes, right? We used to have, we, we went through a phase where um, research was difficult and it became easy. And, and, and we were talking about screens and, and different challenges. Now challenges are getting wider, so we need, we need new recipes. If you take a look at this uh, little, little graph here, you can, you can see how technology is actually catching up with us. 
So um, yeah, as fast and as quick we can we can get this done. It's going to be much better. But let's back let's back a bit to the main topic. Um, so usability was the Kickstarter for me, and then I learned a lot during my career, and uh, I went through different companies, and I started realizing that apart from the fact that there's different maturity levels on design and UX in different places, there's two uh, things that I'm worried about. There's an like, immediate cost of not having a good strategy, and there's an imminent cost of not having it, right? So for me, this is my subjective view on it. Um, the immediate cost brings, like, there's no clear objectives, right? There must be, like, probably uh, they want to make money. That's clear. <laughs> we all want to make money. But uh, there's no direction. So usually teams are running in circles trying to go fast, but they're going nowhere. There's a lot of copy and paste, like following the competitions or looking at these uh, main brands, uh, how they do things. And basically, we're just copying the same problems they have without realizing. People become task-oriented. So we lose the value of collaboration between teams. And what happens usually is like, I got something to do, I just do it, and then just pass it on. And um, contrary to have a collaboration with other teams, we can add value to the small task, and they start adding up, and this is completely different. Um, being task-oriented creates ga gaps in between the areas, right? It's, uh, it's really bad for the company. There's bad communication. Nobody takes ownership of, of what they're doing. There's absolutely no room for innovation. And that's something that worries me in this particular time, right? We're talking about an, an incredible, you know, emerging market of new gadgets and, and, and possibilities, and we're not take, uh, taking care of it. And then the assumption-based design uh, that is a shock we have in the office when you know a director of a manager comes with a requirement and, and they actually don't don't know about it, but they're pushing it really hard because they believe that their assumptions are going to be a success with no validation whatsoever. Um, and then the imminent cost is you're going to end up with a l low quality product or you're going to have like low quality service and that this is really bad for conversion, right? You're going to have bad sales. There's going to be no growth. Um, the low return rates are really, really bad for any kind of company. Um, there's going to be a constant rework. I'm OK with reworking as long as we know where we're going, right? And this is a huge, huge expense if you don't know where you're going and you need to rework every day because somebody don't like it or the manager doesn't feel like, uh, like it's good enough. The team is going to be. Uh, demotivated and they're going to lose the passion of what they're doing and that's, uh, that's an incredible huge cost for any company. It's just people going for the paycheck and nothing else. And it creates a really bad company culture. Like I left companies because they didn't want to change. They actually was, they're, they're, they were drive by only making money or, or showing off some numbers. And it's really difficult to attract talent. When you bring talent and they start asking you about, whoa, how you solve these problems, what's your process, and you try to say, we want to do this, we want to do that, but we're not doing it, uh, it's really, really difficult. I'm sure you're familiar with more different problems than a company that doesn't have a strategy. Uh, I just try to enumerate a few of them. But it's not, a, it's, not, it's not all about money in UX, right? It's not about all... How, how much money we can make if we invest a little bit in, in design process. It's about people. Uh, it's about people. It's about understanding their needs. It's about understanding how to think, how to feel, how to help them. Um, it's about empathy, emotion, empowerment, motivation, fun, accomplishment, right? When you have, when you have a good process in your company and you spend like a lot of effort with your team trying to solve a problem, and then you validate that solution, and then you, you, you get a successful t uh, feature out there, and people start using it, and you see their reactions, that's really, really, uh, it's a great motivation for you and for your, for your teams. Um, so who, <laughs> have you ever heard something like this? I mean, 
it happened to me like a, a long, uh, a long time, too many times, <laughs> and recently as well. So, focus on the queen wins as long as directional um, and they're directional and they're f focus on actually things that it makes sense. Uh, I think it's fine, right? I'm not, I'm not against it, but. Focus on quick wins sometimes is a, it's a trap, man. You're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna go for it, you're gonna build it, you have no validation on, on the things you're building, and then you're gonna need to change it until somebody likes it. And that could be your manager or, or, or yourself, I don't know. Um, so I'm not saying don't focus on the quick win, wins, try to be, have a methodology to identify those. Um, we were asking for, for some time and budget for doing a research um, and a two really important project on our company. And I heard this, this from a product director. Like he stopped the meeting and he says, guys, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a user as well, I know what we need. And so my face was sort of like this, <laughs> trying to understand what he meant. Like you're, you're one user, you're all the users, like what, what are you trying to say? So finally, we convinced him to, to move forward with the research. And we sent our researchers all over Southeast Asia to collect a lot of information about how sellers, um, how buyers um, uh, perceive sellers, right? It was really broad. And uh, our researchers came back with a really interesting uh, report. And we were in the meeting, and we were showing this. I don't know if you can, I mean, it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to talk about the results, but it, what it makes sense is we ask, we ask the buyers if they were willing to pay more if they had, you know, uh, sellers with good ratings, that it makes sense. And most of them, they say, yes, that's more valuable for me than just good prices. And this, the same guy said something like, what? In the meeting of the meeting, and I was, I, then I realized that this guy has like this, you know, um, this visceral feeling that it was wrong. The research was wrong, and he expressed it like that, and I felt so bad. I mean, I felt angry. I was like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> we send people over all the countries and we ask them questions, and they reply. It's not like we came up with these graphs to try to convince you. So I think if we go really high level, uh, one of the problems I saw more, more often in different organizations is there's a, you know, there's a process that is pretty li linear. So business come with a request, uh, design thinks a really good solution or the best solution they can in that like, constraint of time, and then engineering does the best it can to deliver. Um, and of course, this creates gaps because business has their own expectations, design, interpret those expectations, and create its own expectations, and so on. So um, that creates a lot of gaps in something that it should be unified, right? Um, but I, as, this is something I say sometimes. It has no value when, to say things where you're against. Like, I, I don't think this, that's valuable at all to communicate. I think what defines us is to say what we're in favor of or what, what we like and uh, express, you know, in, um, I speak Spanish, so it's, it's not exact translation. In Spanish, it sounds much nicer. <laughs> so uh, what, I, what I've been learning these last years is like the best user experience doesn't come from one place, it comes from a lot of places at the same time, right? It's, um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a effort of a lot of things combined. It's not just one per perfect pixel or one perfect business strategy or one perfect line of code. It's about how those things combine create a better experience. Um, and the spectrum of this overlap is huge. There's so many things inside, right? So it makes no sense to split it. It doesn't say, it, it does, it, I, don't, I don't think it's wrong. Sometimes it works, but from my point of view, it doesn't make sense to split it. So um, usually we see today, there's amazing tools to actually bring this to life. And one of them is design thinking. 
that it tries to grab all these things with a fr framework to solve problems um, and set a same direction for all the areas at the same time. And simply, simply is because UX is a reflection for all the areas combined, and not just one or the other. John Mehta says um, the role of designer is constantly changing, and it changes in relationship with the way business change and technology change. And I think it's really accurate if you think about it, right? At the beginning, designers or, or thinkers were pushing forward with really innovative ideas, and it was really hard to build those things. Then technology got up and, and, and got it right, and now we have uh, more, more technology available and we can do incredible things. So I think uh, it's time to design push again. <laughs> and um, if you think about the tools we have today available, um, why just thinking about the product of their service? Why don't think about, you know, wider? How we can make the entire company solve problems in a way that is effective you know, and is iterative, and is um, and is actually adding value to everyone. Because I said before, like UX, it brings a lot of interesting uh, tools. So I think it's time we start using it all over the place. So I had I showed this talk or this deck before to different people, and uh, I got really interesting feedback. I'm, uh, I would like to hear you guys what you think after. Um, so they told me, well, okay, so UX is really valuable. I got it, right? It brings a lot of really cool things to the table. But how you can quantify <laughs> that value? Like, how, do you, how can I bring information that is, I don't know, to my business manager and tell him this is what we should be doing because this is the, you know, the fact. This is the number. So... Um, and I talked with business guys, and they told me, yeah, I understand the process, I understand everything, but I need to make more money, so I tried to come up with different strategies to do it. And I'm telling them, well, this will help you. And I brought some information about it, so uh, you can just share with your peers or managers as well. So there's something called the Design Value Index. Design Management Institute, I think it's a London company, came up with this. And uh, basically, what they do is they grab a lot of design-led companies and they compare it in the stock market with other companies that are like the uh, they're not or they're not design-led, and the index prove that companies that, uh, which make effective use of design outperform the peers, and it confirms that design is an integral part of a good management. Right? It's not about pixels; it's about management now. And if you look at the graph, the results over the last 10 years, over, you can see design-led and emerging index companies, red and yellow on the top, and then all the other measurements are <laughs> down there. It's like a 200 plus improvement. And we're talking about money. We're talking about stock market here. So I think this is a good proof to say, Companies that are being led by design, not by pixels, but design as a way of solving problems, are way more valuable than other companies. Um, the Design Council, in also London, uh, published a report in 2007 called The Value of Design. The Value of Design proves evidence of how business in UK uh, businesses that use design in different aspects of, of, of their company, not just uh, organizational, but also service, product, marketing, whatever you want to call it. And they come up with some insight. The report is pretty long. Uh, you have the link down there if you want to see it. But I just brought like three main items that I thought were really interesting. So um, the first one is we already share it, right? The design-led businesses outperform key stock market indices by 200%. That's convincing to me, right, right there. But if you're not convinced, there's another quote that is really interesting that says, every 100 pounds a design alert business spend on design increased to over 20, 225. And that's also really valuable. And the last one says, like, on average, design alert business increased their market share by 6.3% through the use of design. So 
um, you can you can read the entire the the report is pretty interesting, but it's pretty old. So if we <laughs> two two oh seven right, um, it's, it's it's quite old. So if we go further in time in in twenty fourteen, uh, Shane Ray grabbed that report and he amplified a, li a little bit more, uh, and he find out that that's true. Like implementing design in your company is really value and it makes you earn more money, but he also found that. Uh, it helps you also reducing costs, right? And in, in case of Procter & Gamble, it reduced costs by one billion a year. Just by designing a new process to create a different kind of plastic that is way better, that is like normal standard, right? It's thinner, it's cheaper to make, it's environmentally friendly, and some other things. If you move today, um, there's, a, there's another report that I think is really interesting to read, at least to see the facts, to have a, a clear argument when your manager says, we need to move this fast. Well, but we can make more money, right, if we do it this way. Um, this report examines the skills of design in the company, not just the, the, the return of investment. And basically, Design skill, the, one of the findings is design skills are connected to innovation. Like, that's straightforward. If you want to be an innovative company, you need to bring these elements to, to your company. Well, and then there's like um, 10 pounds per hour more product, productive than UK company, average in, in any other company. And the design skills are worth 209 billions only in the UK. And their value is keep growing faster than a uh, faster rate than the wider UK economy. And that freaks me out a little bit. Like, whoa, it means like design skill now should be a must, right? We all need to start training on those. Um, and I have much more. So um, more examples, but I think it's going to be boring if we talk about numbers all the time. So I'm going to mention some things and then we'll move on, right? So. Um, there's also really interesting uh, findings on, on, you know, startups that we all know, like how Sendes increases the usage of the search function four times and article views in eight times. Um, that's a pretty interesting success as well. Um, Uber Eats roll out to 80 different cities and keep on innovating. That's a really interesting example to look around. If you Google these examples, you're going to see the reports, you're going to see the numbers. Um, Airbnb, when it started, they were making 200 uh, euros a week. And they went into, they, they tried to understand what was the problem, why we're not growing. And they realized the quality of the pictures was really bad. <laughs> so what they did, they had no money, right? They flew to New York to the people who was publishing their apartments. They rented a camera, a high definition camera, and they took pictures of the apartments that they were published back then. And they're increasing uh, the revenue in 400, 400 euros. So they went to 200 euros in one week to 400 euros a different week. And then they keep in doing the same process of understanding what are the problems, why people is not renting. And now they're like freaking huge. They're all over the world. They're making a lot of money. Um, this example for me is really interesting because Nike uh, dropped the spending on marketing 40% and somehow the increase the sales by 20, 20, 25 billion. And that's impressive, like how they did it. They changed the entire strategy on how Lyft disrupted the transport, transportation industry and Uber copied them and then Didi and then like all the other companies that are just follow the same. Um, so to recap this section just quickly, uh, we're basically here to solve problems, right? That's, that's, that's what it is. And great UX comes from a collaborative effort, not just us pushing pixels or writing code or making business strategy better. Design lead companies create more value. That's proven. You can see the reports. And good design also can help you to reduce the cost of your company. That's also really positive. And a strong strategy keeps the team engaged and motivated. So, what I see that a good strategy of UX comes live in a company brings a lot of value as well, but inwards, right? Not just about product and numbers and sales. Um, 
apart from all these, these things, having a clear and, and uh, unified vision helps uh, the team to you know, follow the same route and fight the same battles and be more cohesive. Um, the interdisciplinary col collaboration is really interesting if you ever experience it. Like when you have a point of view and then um, somebody from business or from, um, from tech or from marketing chips in into your idea and it becomes bigger and better and, the, the, um, and wider, right? You start seeing your, the problem from different, different perspective. Uh, UX is objective, it's data driven, right? You do the research, you do your validation, you look at the numbers, you look at people using the product. So it's objective and there's no room to discussion when you have a good research or, or research well done. And it brings innovation all around. You're always thinking outside the box because you know your constraints, you know uh, your users, you know your context, you know everything. And it creates new business opportunities. It allows new crazy ideas, try new things, and suddenly you realize that there's an opportunity to create a new unit business in your company. So aim higher, man. <laughs> don't, uh, don't, don't, be, don't be just a, a pixel pusher, right? So I thought bringing this Escher quote that I think is really interesting, um, you need to attempt the absorb in, or, absorb in order to achieve the impossible. And I think it's, uh, it's really interesting coming from him that he was a great artist and he always trying these new geometrical and crazy um, perspectives. So some tips about um, what happens when you start your own strategy, right? I think every company is different. Uh, they have different goals. Um, they have different ways of doing things. They have different cultures. So um, I think the main thing here is to just take small steps, right? If you want to change everything at the same time, it might be risky because getting everyone on board is really difficult. So. First of all, you need to understand what's the current step, like where you are, where you want to be. And when you know where you want to be, you just document the vision. Like you just create a document, you write it down, right? Um, what are you aiming for? So everyone can just like relate to it and access to that information. Um, just create a roadmap, you know, where you are, where you want to be, create all the steps in between and try to achieve, you know, uh, small things. If you set achievable goals, it's going to be easier to execute, it's going to be way easier to communicate, it's going to be easier to achieve. And every time you achieve one, you're going to feel awesome, right? Um, define the key metrics, get all the data you can, right? Try to set up your teams to actually look at that information. If it's like a tracking, device, tracking system or it's a research, whatever. And know your constraint and get your proper tools. I think. Um, I don't remember who said that, but I think it's really accurate. Designers thrive in, cons in constraints. So that's also a really good tip. If you wanna, if you wanna be um, accurate with your design and you wanna create amazing things, you need to set up your constraints, your time constraints, you know, your um, technical constraints, etc. Uh, if, you, if you propose yourself to make a design in one day and then test it, uh, probably is more valuable than if you spend a week just looking at the details. <clears throat> and try to get everyone on board, like your peers, your superiors, your managers, you know, your reports. Tell them what you want to do, tell them what you want to accomplish, tell them how you want to do it, what are the steps, and try to get feedback on the process constantly. Review and iterate constantly, because it's not it's not just about the product, it's about how you reach to build a product as well. And take it slow. I mean, um, yeah, baby steps. So I thought about bringing an example of uh, how this is happening in a big corporation, because it's inspiring, <laughs> at least for me. Um, and every time I, I think about user-driving corporations, there's like two big names that come to my mind, right? The first one, uh, not, the, not the best one, but the, the first one that comes to my mind is Google. And I think they did a great job after the 2000, they, they come up with this integrated kind of look and feel and experience for all the products 
And that was really challenging. And right now they're like leading as well on how we should do things. And I think it's really cool. Um, the other one that it comes to my mind is Apple, of course. Apple has uh, designed at its core. You know, uh, Don Norman was the first one to define what are the design guidelines for this company. And some of them, they're still around. So they were like pretty strong. Um, and Apple, of course, they build awesome products. I, I'm an Apple boy myself. I have an iPhone and things. Of course, they had a few set, setbacks, right? Not everything on Apple was incredibly amazing. But um, I thought about bringing a different, different example, more challenging one, something that we don't relate with it like every day. This company used to build uh, hard drives. They started doing computers really in the early ages, right? And now they're building really powerful and interesting uh, devices. And I'm talking about AVM. Like, look at this monster, right? IBM is living a huge transformation. It's incredible. They, they decided to bring design at the score of the company. And in order to do that, they, they, they aim it to hire a thousand designers and train the entire workforce, like everyone, in how design thing uh, works, from executives to interns. And that's really powerful. And they call in design thinkers. And I think it's really interesting to make this distinction. They're not designers. They're not engineers. They're design thinkers. So a new way of, uh, not new, but a different way of thinking. And the transformation goes like, it's impressive. They have like people in 175 places. They're over 300,000. Um, and they're basically expanding the role of design to design thinking framework. They have their own version of it. And um, they, they say that will enable the company to humanize solution for real world problems. And I, they use the word humanize. That I think it's really powerful. It like engloves all the things that we live in, right? I think they're doing a great job. I actually love them. I, I had the chance to see some of the presentations around. And they're really inspiring because they, they were like a data commercial driving company a few years ago. And now they're doing all this huge transformation. Uh, and they're doing something interesting inside a company that I thought uh, it, it worth sharing. That is, they, they're changing the ratio, uh, the designer developer ratio. And they're changing it. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge trend right now for. The, the, the impact they're having is pretty interesting because in 2012, there was one designer every, every 72 colors. And that's like a lot of colors for one designer. Today, they have one designer every eight colors, and they have one mobile designer every three colors. And that rate is like huge, if you think about it. Like the, the transformation they're going through is impressive. Uh, and this happened in the last decade. Like they started this process quite a long time ago, and they're still going on. And they're not the only ones. They're not the only ones. There are a lot of companies going to the same trend. They realize that design thinking framework is a powerful, powerful tool. And in order to you know bring this new way of thinking ins inside a big company, they're doing all these things to change it. And designer developer ra ratio was a huge problem back then in. 10 years ago. I mean, I was one designer with 50 other de developers, and it happens to me in a lot of companies. And it was really hard to comply with so, m so much demand. Um, but if, if you're clear on your direction and you do take the baby steps, there's a lot of people who's going to start seeing the value right away, and it will help you out. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, IBM, they're, they're also working on their own framework that is based on design thinking. And I don't know if they're doing it for a branding purpose or they're actually trying to improve it. Um, I didn't experience this myself, but I read it on their website and encourage you to take a look. There's a link down there. They call it the loop. And basically, they have three phases, observe, reflect, and make. So I'm pretty sure we can relate to this, right? First, we research, then we understand, and then we build. Um, the keys for this, uh, for this uh, framework, they call it uh, heels playback and sponsor users. And I think this is really interesting. Heels is um, the guidelines on how you're going to build your team in order to solve a problem, right? 
Uh, here's a nice graphic so we don't see text only. Um, heels is how you accommodate your team. What kind of roles and um, expertise you need to solve a problem. The playbacks are basically the iteration, like how your team is going to interact over time. Um, and the sponsor users, I think, is a great upgrade for the framework. Because they, what they do is they, they have this feature, they know the users that use the feature, and they get one of those users as a sponsor of the feature. Um, so you actually have to interact with a real person to try your product or to understand how to improve it. And the main principles are focusing on user outcomes, and it makes sense, restless in reinvention, which is reworking and working, uh, and diverse and powerful teams. That I think that's, that's one of the most powerful things, right? Just have a diverse uh, group of people trying to solve the problem. Um, the responsible for all these is um, Karel Frendenberg, and I think I'm pronouncing it right, I think. So anyway, this guy is a designer academic and uh, is doing this work in IBM and it's really inspiring. I encourage you guys to take a look at their blog, his blog, and he has a podcast as well that is really interesting. Um, it's one of my new, uh, you, I'm, I'm a fan right now. I mean, I saw this guy talking at a few conferences and it's really interesting. So you can check it out there. The IBM site is really interesting. They documented the entire process and it's really, uh, it's really insightful to see how a company thinks about design thinking. But if you guys want to know more about the framework that the original one, design thinking, uh, Adobe has a really interesting um, documentation about it, right? So if you want to take a look, uh, it's online workshop. You can do it like in a week or so. Um, and it will give you like a span of, well, what's design thinking about, where are the tools around it, and how, how you can grab little pieces and bring into your uh, company. So I got some more stuff uh, to share. Um, I tried to make it sweet and colorful, so it's more entertaining. We're just about end, end part of the talk, and I know I talk too much, and uh, I, I brought a lot of information as well. So, I work at Lazada, right? Everyone knows Lazada here? So nobody knows Lazada. <laughs> ah, I see two hands, that's good. Ah, more, more, okay, good. So Lazada operates here in Southeast Asia. Uh, for the guys who didn't raise their hand, it's an e-commerce platform. Um, now we're working with Alibaba Group, so we're joining forces in a lot of things. It's a really interesting phase on the company. But uh, to share a little numbers, Lazada is pretty huge in Southeast Asia, right? There's a lot of users, there's a lot of transactions, um, there's a lot of things happening on mobile, there's a lot of things happening socially, and there's really, really interesting things um, that we want to do in the company. And from the UX team, and um, we thought about a lot of things that we were doing wrong, right? We, were, we knew that there was a lot of things we can improve. Let's, let's call it like that. A lot of opportunities, even a little more positive. So I thought about sharing some key things that we did to start driving change in the company. And believe me, guys, it's really difficult. It's not like we implemented this and we're good. Like it's an ongoing, ongoing um, effort. But the first thing we did with the, with the team was, okay, how we want to solve problems? Where, where are we going to be when this is awesome, right? When the process is done and we're working as, as we want. So we went on and we defined, we defined it a process. The team did a great job doing this. And we documented. We documented all the phases to uh, what we think we should be doing to understand and build the product, right? Um, we document in, uh, from the intent, current state, future state, design, and the test phase. We define in the objectives, some considerations, the actions, collaborators, and the expected outcome from each stage. And this is really important because it's a reference material. Every time you're doing something, you can go back to it and say, ah, okay, I can just do all these things now. I can just push the team to do more research or do this and that. Apart from defining the, the process, we run um, 
a couple of workshops. We thought, okay, we're gonna bring the product development team together and we're gonna run a creative workshop using this framework so we can raise a little bit more awareness of how we can use these tools to solve problems. And that was, uh, went really, really well. Um, this happened, I think, online. Uh, started in Vietnam, right, John? Vietnam, and it was on, an online workshop also together with the Bangkok office. Uh, and, and the results were awesome. Then, then all the product people was talking about the same things. Then we also uh, got into the projects. When we raised a little bit the awareness level, we got into the projects and we said, hey guys, you're trying to solve this problem? Okay, we have this thing we can do. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting. Let, let us try, just sitting, uh, get together in a room for a while, run these tools and you'll see what happens. And that was incredible. We got a list of new opportunities that we can execute right now and some others that we cannot because we don't have the, the platform for doing it. But the reaction of, of the company was intense. We also run some exploration uh, workshops, basically to understand from the business unit that I want to try to push new uh, businesses in the platform, okay, how we can approach, how we can approach these opportunities. Um, and that was like incredibly positive. Now uh, different teams from the company are asking us to collaborate with them in running this process to understand how to move on and forward and, and do it quicker. And then we did a lot, of, a lot of noise, but this one in particular I really like. We created a club that it runs every quarter, and we bring, uh, last time we, bring, we brought this movie from Ambition um, that is called Design Disruptors. I highly recommend, guys, just take a look. We brought it in, uh, we screened the movie, and we have a conversation about design and uh, product development and product design. And it was like completely insightful, not just the content of the movie, but the conversation we have with our, our own uh, colleagues. So we're making a lot of noise, and the company now is listening. So um, the, the, we define it, I think it worked, and it's working because we defined achievable goals. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't that hard. Like, we come up with the process, we generate some content to share, we run a few design workshops to, you know, level up the awareness. Uh, we brought content from outside to inspire all the people to understand what we're doing, and we keep on making noise, right? So, uh, I'm about to finish, but um, I just want to show some pictures <laughs> related to... Uh, to change, right? How, how about change um, and how difficult it is, right? So Andy Warhol said, like, they always, they always say that time changes things, but you actually have to do it yourself, right? Time definitely changes things, but if you don't do nothing, if this doesn't work either. So small steps, achievable goals, and you're going to get there. I know that sometimes it's really painful. Like, you're trying to push forward something, that's my wisdom too, by the way. Um, it was really painful. Um, so you try to push something and people push back because they're afraid of change, they don't know what it's about. So bringing awareness, I think, uh, is one of the first challenges. And it seems like an impossible task, right? That you're like fighting against uh, the status quo and, and then uh, it feels like it's, it's an immense effort but don't worry about it. I mean, there's, you're, you're not alone, right? You're going to start recruiting an amazing team for sure. You're going to get colleagues and peers from different companies. This is um, some of the guys from uh, Alibaba and uh, Lazada designers. They're all great. I can, I can vouch for any of those guys. They're incredible, incredible people. Um, and then know your standards. We don't need to reinvent the wheel like IBM is doing or trying to, you know, fit like a new framework, we don't, need, we don't need to do that. We can just piggyback on whatever is there already and it's impressive and it's really cool. Um, and, and go out and connect. Just let's have a conversation after this. Uh, let me know what you think about what kind of problems are you running into. You know, maybe I can just give you a hint or not. Or maybe I learned something new. And go, you know, really, go and connect. Like, I just reached out to this guy the other day and I told him, hey, I'm going to show some of your things on a conference, so what do you think about it, how do you feel about it? And it was a thrill, he get back to me and we had a conversation and I thought, I thought 
uh, at the beginning, when I, when I did it, I, I was a little bit afraid that oh, it's going like, to you know, forget about it or ignore me completely. But definitely it didn't. He saw that I was trying to also drive a little change. And I told him, um, just pu push me your data. <laughs> Give me some more info. Um, and some of this in the, in the presentation already. And go, uh, go out, get inspired, right? Talk with people, see what they're doing. Uh, not only on, on work-wise, just go and watch a movie and try to bring some of that uh, experiences back home. Um, and try to inspire people as well. Just show what you're working on. Um, there's definitely an interesting conversation. Everyone, everyone knows something that somebody else doesn't know, right? And try to have fun, man. Don't make it, don't be stressed. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> it's, it's hard, but try to have fun in the middle. Um, and that's it, guys. Thank you very much. You're the best. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, so we have, one, uh, we have one question. We only have time for one question um, because we're a bit strapped for time and we had a very, very great sharing from Nathan. So is, is there anyone that wants to ask a question, perhaps? Okay, so, so you can find him afterwards if you are, if you are too shy to ask right now. Um, we'll present the, the token of appreciation to him. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan, and uh, this is a small thing from us. Um, Thank you. Man. Yeah. Thanks a lot for being here. Awesome. Yeah, no problem. <laughs>